It is my honor to introduce Mr. Robert Cardillo. Currently in private practice at the Cardillo Group, he was recently the director of NGA, where he led its engagement with the commercial geospatial industry. Prior to that, he was deputy director for intelligence integration at the ODNI and also served as the deputy director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. He is currently a member of the Intelligence Community Studies Board of the National Academies. And he's on, that is to say, he's on our sponsoring board for this colloquium. Mr. Cardillo has a BA in government from Cornell, a master's degree in international security from Georgetown, and an honorary doctorate from St. Louis University. Today, he will talk on providing security and protecting privacy on an instrumented planet. Thank you, Robert, for joining us today. Um, thank you, Joe, for having me. Um, I was reminded during Anthony's presentation, the reason that uh, myself and Sue Gordon, who was then my deputy director at NGA, uh, came up with a plan to recruit Dr. Vinci to come back to government and to help us disrupt uh, what we thought needed to be disrupted within the NGA. And uh, there are different views on how that disruption went. I vote it went uh, very, very well and continues to serve NGA quite well today with their development core and data core and AAA programs. But uh, as you all just heard, Anthony has uh, just uh, a wonderful perspective and, uh, and a challenging one about our profession. I'm going to pick up where Anthony ended his, his remarks around the issue of, of ethics and, and of, of, of privacy and civil liberties in what I call an instrumented planet. Um, as Anthony described, you know, we are fast approaching the point at which this technology will uh, create uh, a persistent uh, surveillance capability 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And the, that will uh, enable uh, a literal model of our planet and everything that's happening on it. And one can imagine many benefits from such, such a model, uh, including natural disaster preparedness and response, enhanced measurements of our environment and real-time detection of nefarious actors and actions. And such a world will also demand that we rethink privacy itself and, 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 and challenging us to find the optimum balance between the benefits of this technology and their effects on our privacy and the potential for misuse and the implications for national security. So uh, what I'll talk about is as we continue to embrace uh, the technology and the innovation that Anthony just described, uh, I would argue that the demand for transparency and the reality of that transparency ex escalates exponentially. And by the way, I find that attribute contributory to our success as a liberal democracy in this technological age. And I will try to explain that. First of all, this is not a new challenge. Almost 2000 years ago, uh, the Roman poet, poet Juvenal posed this question. Uh, in Latin, quis costirat ipsos custodis, literal translation, who will guard the guard themselves? Now for our purpose, a variant on that translation will be more constructive. Who watches the watchers? Now in the past, the watchers were governments for good and for bad. The original driving uh, drivers for remote sensing technologies was national security. And it was almost wholly owned and operated by our government. The sensitivity of that technology was kept under strict controls. It was highly classified. There were many barriers to admission. And so that in itself provided a, a protective capability to, to its use. But today our world is inundated with information resulting from our dependence on that technology results, re resulting in the watchers being more and more private companies. So it's a decade since the Apple created its app store and more than two decades since General Motors introduced uh, OnStar. 
Since that time, the majority of Americans, myself included, have application by application consented to carrying with our person a device that tracks our location and often our activity and often passes all that back to private companies. Now, this is the case done mostly for convenience. Uh, and it would, though, I would argue, would also be the case, even through those, even though those corporations that control that data are far less accountable than the government might be. We can obviously get into this Q and A in Q and A and discussion, and I do appreciate the difference between a government and a company with respect to what one can do to my civil to my actual liberty, versus the other one can do to my uh, pocketbook. But uh, further along these lines, uh, there was a recent New York Times uh, expose around this issue, and it said the following, and I quote, Americans have grown eerily accustomed to being tracked through their digital lives, but it's far from their fault. It's the result of a system in which data surveillance practices are hidden from consumers, and in which much of the collection of information is done without the full knowledge of the device holders. Many Americans, uh, simply risk embarrassment or inconvenience should their location, locational data be exposed. But for victims of abuse, the risks are substantial. That information could be used by their abuser for further attacks. Uh, we're also reminded that reader, uh, not all are want their locational data shared. And how can we determine what practices or relationships any individual might want to keep private to withhold from friends, family, or the government? Uh, whether you're at a religious institution, a medical clinic, uh, an LGBT uh, business, or other sensitive areas. Now, in many ways, that reality that's being described by the New York Times is the logical result of this decades-long path from government control, as I talked about earlier, to its commercialization. I'll give you another example that's not new. Uh, in the mid-19th century, the telegraph uh, was invented and developed through uh, 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 into changing the way we communicated. But it didn't take long for that advancement to be used in a military situ situation when Union forces ran telegraph wires from elevated lighter than air balloons hovering over Civil War battlefields to provide near real time intelligence on Confederate activities. Now that's 170 years ago. And, uh, and I would argue that what we're doing today is just an acceleration of that kind of application. Now that, in that case, the intelligence and the military advantage was protected from further use so as to mid mitigate the adversarial uh, uh, application back at us. That's the spy versus spy that Anthony talked about. Now today, it's assumed to be a fundamental right of everyone to be able to digitally commute with anyone anywhere on the planet. And, uh, and that is thus the case, but with that right or with that capability comes such uh, a few risks that I'd like to play out. One, one lesson is playing out at a local level. Um, currently, municipal governments are adopting closed circuit television cameras combined with the artificial intelligence that Anthony described in cities across the globe. These cameras are not a new phenomenon. As a matter of fact, they were deployed in the New York Times Square in the early 1970s. The recent combination of this technology, however, with AI-based software creates an end user, end use debate. And adding tension to that discussion, some cities are utilizing private companies to gather publicly available photographs and data from the internet. One service in particular is called Clearview AI. And it's uh, uh, described by some as a reverse image search for faces. And now as the global social networks expand, raw material for such an application grows every day. You take a picture of a person, you upload it, upload it into your system, you get to see public photos, which those match. Now a backbone of that database now has more than 3 billion images that Clearview claims to have scraped from Facebook, YouTube, Venmo, and millions of other websites. But it goes far beyond anything ever constructed by the government or Silicon Valley giants. Now, clearly these combinations should at a minimum raise a yellow flag of caution. That caution would allow sufficient time for debate and discussion around the proposed advantages as weighed against the risk, especially to privacy. Key questions I would offer, who controls the database of images? Who can access that database? For what purpose can the database be accessed? Now, these questions should become standard 
uh, vetting as we debate and then decide our way through living in this persistently surveilled planet while maintaining a healthy balance between national security interests, personal privacy, and civil liberty. Now, if we successfully found that balance, this influx of information is a potentially very good thing. As I noted earlier, since at least the Civil War, the US government has used technology to protect its national security interests. When the Iron Curtain was drawn across Europe 75 years ago, the US government and its allies needed to access the denied territory of the Soviet Union in order to identify the magnitude of the military threat. Wrapped in layers and layers of secrecy, uh, such access was first provided by inventions such as the U-2 aircraft, from there, we needed to see and sense into denied territory motivated us to further advance our tactics, techniques, and procedures and create the Corona satellite system, providing us again a critical advantage over our adversaries, the ability in this case to take pictures from space to inform our decision-making. Over the next 50 years, there was a halting and gradual shift from that capability from the government to the commercial sector. Joe was kind enough to recognize my uh, intent uh, as the director of NGA to accelerate that transition, not to, not to, not to uh, lower the priority of the government's contribution, which is still great, but to increase the capability of the commercial industry to inform uh, the outcome that we still see. Now, this shift has recently accelerated, and there's now a sharp increase in, in commercial capabilities in space. And as Anthony mentioned, this isn't just electro-optical, there's commercial radar satellites, it's those that capture radio frequencies and infrared. Now, most of these companies do look to the US and allied governments for contracting opportunities. The preponderance of their business strategy is commercially based. Use cases from insurance to agriculture to environmental science to smart cities. In a competitive market, not all these companies will be successful, a consolidation of some type would not be unexpected. And this could lead to an aggregation of private capabilities across the spectrum, which may increase capability, but also I would argue risk. Now, just within the visual portion of the electromagnetic spectrum known in our or my profession as electro-optical imagery, there's increased potential to track people at an individual level. With this increase in imagery and data collection and AI, we'll be able to holistically cross-connect data streams from human activity to physical, re physical reality, ultimately answering the question, where are the people? Why are the people there? And where are they going tomorrow? Now, having the ability to answer these questions could contribute to the prevention of mass shootings, police brutality, or maintaining peace during protests or daily life. For instance, law enforcement officers, including local police in Florida, the FBI, and Department of Homeland, Homeland Security have used facial recognition programs like Clearview AI to assist in solving cases involving shoplifting, identity threat, credit card fraud, murder, child sexual exploitation cases, to name a few. On the other hand, such persistent surveillance can infringe upon a sense of privacy and the right to be anonymous, if that right still exists. While that tension, it crosses two imperatives, the security of all versus the freedom of one, it, all bridges, it also bridges to the broader tension at the national level. In this case, the question becomes, what powers do we confer upon the federal government in order to secure our interests while sustaining our fundamental right to privacy? More specifically, within the federal government, there is a particular challenge for the US intelligence community. The influx of publicly available information raises the question of how the government, how our intelligence community will regulate and monitor the incorporation of this data into its assessments and cases in the name of national security. Today, our IC is inundated with information from various sources and means of collection. As we learned, unfortunately, from Edward Snow Snowden's leak of classified information obtained during his time as a contractor with NSA, the US government collects metadata from telephone companies. While there are strict regulations on why metadata can be reviewed, and it was collected and held in government databases, albeit securely, the intent is that this information enhances our security. But as former director, both of the CIA and NSA, General Mike Hayden said, and I quote, described a hypothetical situation in which a number connected to a terrorist could be run against the metadata already collected to help investigators find additional leads in the name of national security, end quote. And additionally, General Hayden stated that the US government uses this information to eliminate adversaries to increase the security of our nation. However, uh, it isn't always that clear. 
In addition to metadata collected by the NSA, the IC receives information from satellites emitting imagery taken across the globe at any given time and from human beings attempted to assist the US. They also collect and analyze publicly available information from the internet of private companies. While discussing the Snowden leaks, General Hayden went on to say, quote, what the information collected by NSA cannot do are all those things that allow someone to create your social network, your social interactions, your social behavior. Now, I don't use General Hayden as the end of the debate. I, I use his point of view as a perspective on this debate. And I would say that this information is provided to the public via applications or social media platforms by the average American on a daily basis. Much like the majority of the world, the IC is now faced with significant challenges and opportunities when it comes to the influx of publicly available information from sources like social media, data collected by private companies. As part of a larger effort by President Obama's administration to update the guidelines for the IC concerning this information, the CIA declassified and released new internal requirements. And these requirements, quote, explicitly call out the rules and regulations concerning the acquisition, retention, use, and dissemination of publicly available information concerning US persons. And to be clear, the IC is still digesting the after effects of Snowden. Setting aside now the merits or lack thereof of his actions, it seems clear that the US had a window of opportunity in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 to have a frank conversation with the American public. That conversation would have been grounded in the new reality of the threat to US security by unconventional actors and action. I think in such an environment, one could reasonably have expected a different calculus along the spectrum of security and civil liberties. But because we chose not to have that conversation, many, many Americans felt like their government had overstepped the bounds and tilted the playing field towards security at the expense of privacy. So with that as my experience, I can see a parallel path for the imaging portion of that same electromagnetic spectrum. And if we can only, if we cannot only learn the lessons of the past, but also apply that learning in a way that advances our holistic conversation, being the government and the between the government and the governed, this is that moment. Rather than waiting for the next crisis, let's openly and straightforwardly lay out the risks and benefits in a way that advances the quality of the debate and increases the likelihood of a positive outcome. Of course, the opposite approach could have deleterious effects. If not prob properly regulated with transparency, these technological advances and subsequent abundance of information could also be used to threaten our national security. For example, in that same expose previously referenced, the New York Times used locational da data to track one of pre then President Trump's Secret Service agents. And by association, uh, and by association, likely President Trump himself. Now, separately, terrorists have been incorporating technology into their attack for years. In, to in 2016, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, ISIS conducted its first successful attack using a drone. It's believed and feared that the combination of drone expertise and more sophisticated AI could allow terrorist groups to acquire and develop lethal autonomous weapons or killer robots, which would dramatically increase their capacity to create incidents of mass destruction. Now, AI could enable terrorist groups to threaten physical security in innovative ways. Autonomous vehicles could be used to deliver explosives. Low-skill terrorists could be endowed with widely available high-tech products and attacks could cause far more damage and attackers could be farther removed from their targets, both in time and location. Now, here's one way I would offer for us to have this healthier conversation to turn, uh, and, and I, in this case, we'll turn to a leading academic and professional journal. And as the expansion of growth of such technology and subsequent surveillance is inevitable and incessant, we need to calculate a means to deal with this reality. So I'm gonna, uh, Go, turn now to a book called The Transparent Society, uh, authored by David Brin. And let me lay out the scenario that he offers as a way for us to have this conversation. And I quote, this is a tale of two cities, cities of the near future, say 10 or 20 years from now, barring something unforeseen, you're apt to be living in one of these, barring something unforeseen, you are apt to be living in one of these two places. Your only choice is which one. Tiny cameras pan left and right, survey traffic and pedestrians, observing everything in open view. Consider city number one. In this place, all the myriad cameras report their urban scenes straight to police central. 
where security officers use sophisticated image processors to scan for infractions against the public order, or perhaps an established way of thought. Citizens walk the streets aware that any word or deed may be noted by agents of some mysterious bureau. Now, let's look at city number two. Things will look quite similar. Again, ubiquitous cameras perched on every vantage point, only here we find a crucial difference. These devices do not report to the secret police, rather each and every citizen of this metropolis can use his or her wristwatch television to call up images from every camera in town. In city number two, such micro cameras are banned for some, from some indoor places, but not from police headquarters. There, are, there, any citizen may tune in on bookings, arraignments, and especially the camera control room itself, sure that agents on duty look out for violent crime and only crime. Now, both futures may seem undesirable, these are extremes, but can there be any doubt which city we'd rather live in if these were our only two choices? And I end quote. So two things I love about what Bryn uh, postulated for us. One, I think it's a useful construct to have the date, but two is the date in which he wrote that book. It was 1998. So 23 years ago, he was already seeing the future that we're, we're living in today. And I would offer, even though that those are extreme cases, as Anthony mentioned, uh, it's certainly not our desire to become the kind of state uh, that we're seeing in the society that we're seeing being controlled, regulated, uh, restricted uh, the way it is in China today. Uh, to me, uh, our, our objective shouldn't be to find a way to out China, China, our, our, our objective should be how do we out America, China, to use our natural gifts and our innate sense of, of uh, innovation and entrepreneurial growth and risk taking while holding at the same time our, the elevation of privacy and civil liberties. So while Bryn's sentiment that transparency is the key to ensuring the abundance of publicly available information is respected and used to improve our world, to address how to protect that public information, both the government and the private sector, we must determine who controls our data, who can access it, why it can be accessed and with what oversight. We need to firmly establish what role, if any, the derived data would play in our legal framework. We ultimately need to answer the question, how might our society adapt, innovate and evolve to harness the power while mitigating the ethical challenges. And as we seek to address that question, we must remember that these are uncharted waters and, many, and uninformed, impetuous actions could have damaging effects. It's essential that this unprecedented situation be addressed with deliberate and well thought action as, we, as well as the flexibility and ability to modify rules and regulations as we better understand the ramifications and consequences of our initial decisions. Now, currently, the most applicable legal notion along these lines may be the Fourth Amendment Equilibrium Adjustment, which, quote, posits that the Supreme Court adjusts the scope of protection in response to new facts in order to restore the status quo level of protection. When changing technology or social practice expands government power, the Supreme Court tightens the Fourth Amendment protection. When it threatens government power, the Supreme Court loosens constitutional protection. Uh, I certainly appreciate that we're all having debates about uh, our position uh, of and the constitution of uh, our court, but I have confidence in that past construct and pushing that forward. Now, while this all is a far cry from what liberal democracies must create in order to adequately protect individuals' privacy outside the court of law, the premise may serve as an appropriate baseline and reminder for fluid, constantly changing law. And I would observe that until we can agree on data privacy norms, it's gonna be hard to create lasting rules around said transparency. Suffice to say, the stakes are enormous. In fact, one could see this discussion and debate as existential, at least as it pertains to human freedoms. The concept that that abundance of publicly available information is changing the definition of private information is one of the concepts that will need to be considered as liberal democracies establish a legal framework to ensure the ethical handling of this data. Private information is no longer limited to a social security number or an account number. Now the aggregation and correlation of data from various sources make it increasingly possible to link supposedly anonymous information to two specific individuals, as I've discussed a couple of times. And the result is that today there's a widening range of data with the potential for personal information to identify us uniquely. 
European Union has been uh, in many ways leading this uh, debate and this discussion, and it brought to fruition in 2018, uh, May of 2018, the General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, which severely altered the privacy laws throughout the European Union. And the GDPR is focused largely on protecting data, personal data and include ra racial or ethnic origin, political opinions, religious beliefs, membership of trade unions, genetic and biometric data, health information, and data around a person's sex life or orientation. Now at the core of GDPR, there are seven principles that don't necessarily act as hard rules, but instead as an overarching framework that is designed to lay out the broad purposes of GDPR. Those principles, lawfulness, fairness, and transparency, purpose limitation, data minimization, accuracy, storage limitation, integrity and confidentiality, and accountability. Current, currently, US privacy laws focus on the threats against individual rights, but those protections are anachronistic in the face of AI, geospatial technologies, and mobile technologies, which not only use group data, but are dependent on it. Furthermore, the Fourth Amendment does not protect against public information. Quote, what a person knowingly exposes to the public, even in his own home or office, is not a subject of Fourth Amendment protection, end quote. In keeping with that basic constitutional principle, federal statutes governing surveillance treat, treat publicly available information as unprotected. So the conundrum, we have search engines like Google leading the way for indexing and categorizing the knowledge deposited by humans into the online world for mankind's benefit, a globally persistent sensing architecture that could lead the way to finding information intelligence, understanding the physical world in real time to benefit all life on earth. Now, like others, I've used the analogy of the rising tide of data that can't overwhelm us by bringing us more data and less information, ultimately reducing our shared awareness. This that tide is cresting in a way that puts us now on the curling edge of the wave. Computer vision, machine learning, AI offer the chance for us to propel into a world of what I call radical transparency. I believe our transparent society is here to stay, no matter how hard one tries to eliminate their digital presence. There's no putting this technological genie back in the bottle. And if you think as transparency as light, as I do, it shines both ways. I believe transparency is good for liberal democratic societies. As to the Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis observed, quote, sunlight is said to be the best of disinfectants. I further believe the bedrock of civil discourse is trust, not so that we agree on every issue, rather so that we appreciate the other perspective and empathize with different views. Properly thought through, an era of radical transparency can lead to a more humane world and a safer world. However, achieving such a world means striking a balance between access and control, between openness and privacy, between good and evil. And as we strive to strike that balance and to calibrate that balance over time, one of the best advantaged one is best advantaged by framing and shaping the key questions in a way that optimizes useful and progressive outcomes. In this regard, three capstone questions remain. Who holds the data? Who can access the data? And what use can be made of that access? The first question, the general global trend toward accountability, transparency, especially relative commercial holding is positive. The more consumers know about the tracking and the use of their location, the more informed their decisions will be. The implications for national security, as is often the case, are more difficult. Herein, the necessary protection of technological enhancements contradict the same transparency that informs the public awareness and debate. But rather than hiding behind the veil of secrecy, I strongly believe the onus is on the government to enable this informed debate. Any incremental loss and advantage over the adversary is outweighed, in my view, by the increased confidence in the government by the governed. Is that confidence? It is that confidence that will most directly lead to the continued growth and relevance of liberal democracies. With that, I'm going to close my remarks. Um, Joe, I'm going to send it back to you. And I guess apologize that I was not entertaining enough to keep your granddaughter interested uh, longer, <laughs> but I'm did glad she peeked in for a minute. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, for those very informative insights on security and privacy. Since we're running a little ahead of schedule, um, we, we've decided to answer a couple, as many as we can, uh, quest of your questions before the break. So our break is scheduled at one. So um, let me ask Anthony to come back online and uh, field a couple of questions that you have sent in uh, for the panel to answer. 
Thank you, Anthony. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Robert, thank you for that. And uh, you reminded me why I said yes to come work for you and Sue, <laughs> just when I think I'm saying something smart and important about technology, you make me realize that I didn't actually ask the hard questions nor answer them. <laughs> and uh, you had the actual important talk. So that was fascinating and, and, and uh, um, really interesting. So thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna start with uh, a couple of questions that came in that address a similar subject. And uh, I have uh, a view to answer it, but um, I'd also like, I'd like to get Robert's view. And um, one is from Jeff Cohen who asked, I think this is a cogent analysis of military intelligence for the battlefield or other forms of conflict, but how will these technologies affect more traditional intelligence? Um, you know, such as uh, determining or evaluating national strategies or detecting conspiracies. I'd suggest that today's AI, even expected AI in the next few years, don't adequately uh, reason or answer the questions. And then Jim Cox asks a similar question. He says, much of what has been described deals with kinetic action at the operational and tactical levels. And he says, you know, two questions. First, in what context by RIA, how do you define intelligence? And second, how tangible might this revolution be for strategic intelligence, where the determination of the government or national intent is always less clear? I think those are those are the right questions to ask. And in fact, when I initially wrote the article and started working on this talk, I I did think about um, how limited AI is uh, right now and how limited autonomous systems are right now. Um, and probably will be for the next couple of years. Um, but when I look at the trend lines in AI in particular, what I see is it being applied to more and more complex situations and you know what you could call strategic situations. And in fact, there is a recent government program looking to apply AI to effectively acting as a general um, in some way. Now, I don't think that kind of strategic AI will be around for the next couple of years, but what I do think, at least in a sort of general sense, what I do think will be around is that AI derived information will inform um, human decision makers. And so it presents the same attack surface and concerns that I was talking about in more of the tactical issues. So um, AI might feed into a decision maker's um, an, uh, analysis of an issue from which they'll make a decision. And I think over time, we'll see just like Centaur Chess, kind of a combination where you're relying on AI to um, help you make these more strategic decisions. And then therefore, um, intelligence officers will have to um, understand the AI systems in order to understand what the humans are deciding to do. And I'll give a real an example from all of our lives. I no longer attempt to memorize anything. Um, I don't even try to file it. If I need a piece of information, I just type it into Google at this point. And I've now Google is essentially part of my thinking. Um, and I probably couldn't even function without it um, at this point. Um, in in any at least I couldn't function um, very quickly. I would have to kind of go back to searching books. So um, I, I think more and more that will be the case for general decision-making. We'll, we'll go towards systems, it might be Google, but it might be other AI-derived systems and we'll kind of be teaming up with them. And therefore we need the RIA, we need to start to understand those systems. So that's sort of my thought, but I actually am mainly interested to hear Robert's thought and what do you think about where does um, some of the concepts I mentioned or some of the things that you talked about go in terms of the tactical operational uses of intelligence versus the strategic geopolitical level. Um, look, I agree with Jeff's, you know, kind of top level point that, you know, that what we're, what we're discussing today is probably easier to imagine as it's applied to those, you know, tactical and especially military situations. But the reason I find that it's equally applicable to the strategic side 
is because of I'll just I'll use Anthony as a modern leader. Um, you know, will will adversarial leaders still try to keep secrets in their head? Of course they will. Will they try to deceive us? Of course they will. Will they try to do things that make us think the opposite of what they intend to do? Yes, that's in the nature of the game. Yet how that leader interacts with technology will in fact inform a little bit more on each of those things I just described. So um, uh, I, would, I would argue that what Anthony searches for on Google helps me understand why, A, what's Anthony interested in today and B, a little bit of what Anthony will likely do tomorrow. Um, yes, it'll be an inference. Yes, it'll be a, you know, a, a projection, et cetera, but that's the nature of our business. So uh, I, I actually think that because the world is becoming so connected, it's become harder in many ways to, um, to disassociate that, that strategic secret from uh, the network. I also agree though, and by the way, I think this is where algorithms and AI especially can help us, is that if your intent is to manipulate that digital fabric in a way that causes confusion or distraction or a false narrative or oh my goodness a fake image you know that is too is much easier to do so to me i think the competition is or or, or the tension is less between tactical and strategic and um, uh, to, to, with your point earlier anthony about the integrity of 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 how you interact with that system. And Anthony will know that, that you know, we stood up an effort there called Geoint Assurance uh, to do just that, that uh, the, the days in which a picture is a picture, right? And an image is an image and uh, no, no uh, upstanding human would ever mess with an image. We, we got over that pretty quickly and uh, understood that we need to think about, put ourselves in the adversary shoes uh, as well as our own. Thanks, Robert. Um, another couple of questions that I'm going to combine. Um, one question was, do you see a time where intelligence assessments would be presented to decision makers as a series of what if holograph events? And, um, and then another question from Susan says, what changes to the president's cabinet or advisory circles would you suggest with the RIA in mind? And I, I would combine this into you know, what does the future briefing, particularly the PDB, look like? And what, what are the people that need to be around decision makers um, when you have their RIA? What is that, that cabinet? What does the NSC look like, for example, given all of this new technology? And I'll, I'll give um, a, a quick view. But again, I'd, I'd like to hear Robert's view. It, I think that just as intelligence officers will have to become more technologically astute, not necessarily technologists, not necessarily developers of technology, but they'll have to incorporate it into their thinking and how they make decisions and put products together, and they'll have to sit side by side with developers. I think decision makers and um, advisors to decision makers will also need to be more technologically astute to incorporate technological means of information collection and analysis into their own thinking and become comfortable with looking at um, a model or a simulation, for example, or a, um, uh, or 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 some other data rather than just purely qualitative approaches, or at a minimum, they'll need to um, understand when a briefer comes to them um, and um, provides that information. Now, I think some tools to do that would be some uh, more sophisticated modeling and simulation technologies and the ability to do what if scenarios and so forth. Um, but I, I think it comes down to how people are trained. Um, and what the expectation is from them. But Robert, I'll, I'll turn it over to you if you have comments on both how the briefings will happen and then who will be around the decision makers or who the decision makers, what the decision makers will need to know how to do. 
Sure. So I'll, I'll, I'll answer the question by telling a story. Um, so I had the responsibility, privileged responsibility, to provide the president's daily brief from 2010 to 2014. And the way that that would work, obviously, there's it's a machine and it cont continually is being you know, uh, crafted and edited and debated and updated. But the morning of, so that that hour before you walk into the Oval Office, I would sit with my briefer. So senior briefer would come to my office at the old executive office building and we'd go over it one final time. And imagine, you know, a government office with a conference table. I'm sitting at the end of it and I, you know, sitting two feet away from my briefer who's laying out all of the classified material that are you know, supporting the, the brief that I'm about to give. Well, purposefully over his shoulder or her shoulder, as the case may be, was a quad screen television with BBC, CNBC, CNN, and Fox News. Well, I just picked those four, but it was you know, some, <laughs> some bit of the world that's happening in real time. Because if nothing else, I knew that the person I'd be briefing in 32 minutes was living in that world, okay, and interfacing with that world. And oh, by the way, interfacing with diplomats and with reporters and with staffers and whatnot. And so th the best we could do from 2010 to 2014 is just try to watch really quickly at the end to make sure we weren't walking into something that had just changed uh, uh, in the real world. So to the, to the person who asked the question about kind of the, the transfer, the medium in which, I fully agree. I don't know if we're going to go to holograms, but we need to go to something that's much more interactive. There's a famous or infamous picture. If you Google my name and President Obama, you'll see me awkwardly like an old guy trying to hit my finger onto an iPad. It's the first time we brought the iPad into the Oval Office. And it's kind of impressive. Oh, look, the White House got hit or the Intel community got hit. Trust me, we killed those iPads before we brought them in there. We took everything out of them other than a display capability. So we went from paper to digits, but we didn't do much more than that. I'd love to have to be able to have a customer be able to walk through, you know, uh, a foreign capital or, you know, um, um, per, have a perspective on a, on a military threat or a, or a negotiated uh, treaty, et cetera, et cetera. And so I do hope we do go in, uh, in that direction um, over time, because uh, look, that that is their world. And if we if we keep walking in there and and just bringing in our closed world, uh, I think the door is going to get a little harder to get in. I think the time is going to shrink down over time. And so I think we have to it. And then just quickly on the scenarios, I, I I'm a big fan of of the idea of of forecasting through scenarios. Um, I know there's a lot of debate about it, and, and I'm actually working with a group at, uh, at Penn now on, on a paper on this, but, but to me, I, I think decision makers will be better served at seeing a range of scenarios. Obviously, we would make our call on the most likely one, but let's face it, life is a little bit left and a little bit right, so I think offering that range uh, is healthy. That, yeah, interesting. And uh... Um, you know, it makes me think about what what's the next awkward picture of the briefer with the president, and what is that? Is it is it the holograph or or, or some? I suspect maybe a video game of some sort, something like that, with a controller handing over. Um, so, kind of on topic on technology, Frederick asks um, Zanthony, you discussed the need to improve S and T intelligence. Please elaborate on how the IC should, uh, could, and should stay on top of s and in emerging disruptive technologies, as well as potentially disruptive applica applications of extant technologies. And then Tim asked, totally unrelated, but it's good setup, what can you share about quantum computing communications and sensing vis-a-vis -vis the RIA? I think that's a good way to illustrate the question. How does the IC today, figure out what technologies are important, what will, what ones will be important, how will they use those technologies? And, and I would add, as somebody who um, interacts with the venture capital community quite a bit, how do you tell the hype from the reality in these new technologies? And with something like quantum computing, that's a great example of that. Quantum computing is absolutely a real technology. I'm not saying it's hype. There's amazing things happening. But the reality is that the application of that technology to solving 
day-to-day problems is is not in the immediate future. It's easy, I think, sometimes to read articles and it seems like it is. And there are some niche applications out there that are doing that. Um, but it's 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 probably much further out where it's going to be p- actually part of operations, which is partially why I didn't include it as one of the three um, breakthrough technologies that I thought would drive the RIA, at least in the near term, although quantum will clearly um, contribute to AI at some point in the future. And so it, my brief view on that is that um, the IC, I think, needs to get really good at answering just those kinds of questions. And not just about hype technologies that are happening in the venture capital community. I think actually InQtel does an amazing job of doing that for the IC. And it's a very significant service that they provide and, and we need it. And there are other organizations out there doing the same thing. But also, what are the technologies that are either secret or just harder to observe that are being developed by other countries. Um, And China in particular, I think will lead on some of these technologies. It won't be absolutely clear um, what they're doing and why and how. Um, And it won't be clear whether it's hype or disinformation that they're gonna use those technologies. And the IC, so the IC will not only have to sort through the same economic, kind of and technological viability questions as it does with commercial technology. But on top of that, layered in the difficulty of collecting classified information, hard to get information on technologies developed in another country, and whether it's hype or disinformation or a little bit of bull. Um, And that's going to be really difficult. And I think we need a a really strong um, capability to to deal with that. Robert, I wanted to get your take, and Dean, if I can ambush you, I see you on my screen, maybe get your take as well, um, uh, because I know you'll have um, extremely good views on it as well. So maybe Robert and then Dean. No, I, I agree. I think I'd love to hear what Dean has to say. <laughs> That was, that was a quick handoff. Well, thank, thank, that, thanks. That was a director's answer, Dean. <laughs> I just that, live, the world I have lived in. Um, so, so the USIC has a, um, and, and all intelligence agencies and the government has a particular challenge, which is that technology moves very, very quickly. And um, government does not move very, very quickly. I think this is a truism for everybody. Uh, who is on this call, who's been experienced with, uh, with government. And, you know, Robert lived it viscerally day to day as the director of big agency and Anthony as well as he came in and tried to make transformational change in what's essentially an entrenched bureaucracy. And it's very difficult. Um, at the same time, the private sector um, does not have the constraints of the bureaucratic state that government must deal with and moves very, very quickly and partly because the consequences of failure are different, okay? An economic consequence, yes, a company can lose money and a company can go out of business, um, but the leaders of private sector companies and venture funded companies and you know, hedge fund funded companies um, make an economic risk calculation with every single calculation that they do in there. And sometimes they're willing to bet 10 to lose nine to have one. Government and national security doesn't often have that option. You know, the 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 um, the cost of getting it wrong can far exceed the um, the opportunity of trying a whole bunch of different things. One of the things we tried to do during my time at ODNI was to shift that landscape a little bit to move more towards risk taking and um, and risk owning and understanding that the risks that we take by not adopting the new technology um, are in in many ways uh, greater um, than uh, the risks we take by avoiding avoiding them. And and so there's this elastic balance, this this risk of loss versus the opportunity cost for for doing new things. So it's it's a really tough challenge. The core of the question is how do you know what the next new technologies are gonna be? Boy, if I could answer that question, um, I wouldn't have been a, 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 
a federal officer. <laughs> I'd have a name like Elon or something, some, something else like that. This is really hard. It's really hard to know which of these things are going to happen. So in 2012, as the world is starting to catch fire with this idea of deep neural networks solving really, really hard problems, the US intelligence community was struggling with how do we get to cloud technology and how do we get uh, to break down walls between our various various organizations so there's this constant there's this constant uh, mismatch so anyway more to come on that uh, after the lunch break perfect perfect answer and transition Dean. if we couldn't have set it set it up better if we planned it um, so i think with that um, we can take a break and there's still additional questions and we will have some additional time for Q&A at, at the end. So, um, but uh, thank you, Robert. That, that was great. Appreciate it. Joe, I'll turn it back over to you. 